1977, the millions of people who used Britain's M1 motorway shivered with fear as they reached its most northerly point, the city of Leeds. They all knew that terror was stalking its streets. Four women had been murdered in the city by a maniac with a grudge against women. Two others had been slaughtered in nearby towns, and at least four more had been badly injured in his insane attacks with a hammer. All of them had either been prostitutes or women walking alone, perhaps mistaken by him for ladies of the night. Police studied the map of his early attacks, searching for a geographical pattern. His first murder was in Leeds in October 1975. Wilma McCann hit on the head, then stabbed. Next victim, Emily Jackson, also in Leeds, January 1976. The third victim, Irene Richardson, was stabbed in Round Hay Park, February 1977. By now, all women in the area were feeling threatened. His fourth victim, Patricia Atkinson, was struck down in her Bradford flat by four blows from a hammer, April 1977. This time, he left the print of a size 7 Wellington boot on her bedsheet. A newspaper called him the Yorkshire Ripper, because, like Jack the Ripper, his Victorian predecessor, he attacked and disfigured prostitutes. But in June 1977, the Yorkshire Ripper killed a girl who was not a prostitute. Her name was Jane MacDonald, and she was only 16. Now panic really set in. The most experienced policeman in West Yorkshire, Superintendent George Oldfield, was put in charge and publicly staked his reputation on catching the killer. Petitions demanded the return of capital punishment. The police appealed for information and opened special hotlines. Maureen Long was lucky. She was attacked by the Ripper on a piece of waste ground in Bradford in July 1977, but this time he failed to finish his grisly job and she escaped with injuries. For his next attack, the Ripper moved away from Yorkshire across the Pennines to Manchester. It was here, three months later, in October 1977, that he made what could have been a fatal mistake. Cruising the red light district, he picked up Jean Jordan and paid her with a new five pound note. He left it on her when he hit her on the head with a hammer. Later, he went back to look vainly for the fiver, which he realized was traceable. So did the police, who found the note and interviewed every member of 30 firms that shared the money in their wage packets. A team of detectives was put on the job of interviewing the 8,000 people who had been paid with the fivers from the batch that contained the one on the dead girl. But despite several interviews at this house in Heaton, they were as satisfied with the owner's alibis for the nights of the killings as they were with those of dozens of other suspects. The Ripper celebrated his escape by attacking another woman in Chapel Town in December 1977. But he lost his balance when swinging at Marilyn Moore with a hammer, and she screamed loudly enough to scare him away. She needed 56 stitches, but helped to create a photo-fit picture of him. Unrecognized, he went back to Bradford's red light district for his next victim. On the 21st of January, 1978, Yvonne Pearson was working in Lum Lane. She tapped on his car window and asked if he wanted a good time. On some waste ground, he hit her over the head with a walling hammer. He hit the body, and she wasn't found for two months. One cold night, ten days later, in Huddersfield, he picked up 19-year-old Helen Ritker. She worked the cars with her twin sister, who was already occupied with another driver. For the first time, the Yorkshire Ripper had sex with the victim. He left her under these railway arches. George Oldfield gave a fairly accurate picture of his adversary. A picture of a man, middle-aged, uh, 35 to 45 perhaps, uh, an individual who has not previously come to the notice of the police, a man of uh, hitherto perfectly good character who could be pursuing a normal occupation uh, without giving rise to suspicion. The Ripper returned to Manchester 
in May 1978 for his next victim, Vera Millwood. By this stage in the massive inquiry, the police had unknowingly been face to face with the Ripper four times. Perhaps because of this, there was a pause of almost a year before he clubbed his tenth victim in April 1979. This was Joe Whittaker in Halifax, and he finished her off with a specially sharpened rusty screwdriver. She was a 19-year-old clerk with the local building society on her way home near midnight. George Oldfield described what had happened. The position is this, that at 6.30 this morning, the body of Josephine Ann Whittaker, a 19-year-old girl, who lived at 10 Ivy Street, Halifax, was found on playing fields in uh, Savile Park, which is off Savile Park Street. Uh, she had suffered head injuries and other injuries to her body. We know that she visited her, visited her grandmother last evening at 294 Huddersfield Road, Halifax, and left there just before midnight. The indications at the present time are that she met her death soon after that, and uh, the playing fields where she was found were within about 20 yard, 200 yards of her own home. Now came an episode which spun the inquiry off down a false trail. A malicious hoaxer had been sending George Oldfield a series of letters signed Jack the Ripper. They were posted in Sunderland and taunted him at the lack of success. In June 1979, the hoaxer sent a tape recording with a strong Geordie accent, which Oldfield played to the army of reporters covering the case. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, you are no near catching me now than four years ago when I started. I reckon your boys are letting you down, George. They can't be much good, can they? Oldfield had no doubt this was the voice of the killer, and he steered away from following up on clues which led in any other direction. We know now that we are definitely looking for a man who originated in the Northeast. A million pounds was spent on a publicity campaign to trace the presumed Geordie accented killer, but it yielded no results. The real killer had a Yorkshire accent. West Yorkshire police even sent a confidential memorandum instructing other police forces to eliminate anyone without a Geordie accent. The next killing, the 11th, on the 1st of September, was of a Bradford University student, Barbara Leach. She was struck down shortly after leaving a group of friends. Despite the growing doubts of many officers, West Yorkshire police stuck to their theory that the killer must have a Geordie accent, and their publicity campaign was stepped up. A substantial reward was now on offer. Encouraged by all this, Thousands of letters and phone calls poured in, but they inevitably pointed in the wrong direction. The sheer size of the inquiry was now difficult to control. The masses of files and papers making it hard to cross-check information. After a heart attack, George Oldfield temporarily retired from the case. His replacement, James Hobson, later defended the decision to concentrate on the Geordie tapes. And we did what we thought proper. And we did say that it was only 98% sure. And we would still not eliminate people simply because they didn't have a Geordie accent. And we never have done that. All through 1980, the police floundered. When the body of a 47-year-old civil servant named Marguerite Walls was found in a park in Farsley on August the 20th, 1980, the police dismissed it as just another murder, and not the work of the Yorkshire Ripper. The reason was that he had deliberately changed his modus operandi to mislead them, and this time he had strangled his victim with a loop of hemp, knelt on her to finish off the job, and then stripped the body.
they were equally dismissive of another attack he made in Headingley, near the Test Cricket Ground, on the 24th of September, when he almost strangled a 34-year-old woman doctor from Singapore named Upadhaya Bandara. It wasn't a ripper job, said the police, just as they did at a press conference after the Marguerite Walls killing. My feelings at this stage are that it is probably not connected with the ripper killings. Uh, but having said that, uh, I would still keep my options open until the post-mortem examination had been concluded. But it was a ripper killing and brought his known total to 12. The Yorkshire Ripper's 13th and last killing was again in Headingley and again a student, 20-year-old Jacqueline Hill, on the 17th of November, 1980. A reconstruction designed to jog the public's memory showed how she returned from a meeting in central Leeds on a bus. Police appealed for one of the other eight people on it to come forward. Ironically, the meeting was to learn more about her chosen career, probation officer. She got off at a busy and well-lit shopping center near her home to walk to her dormitory lodgings. The streets were lit and people were about, but the Ripper had marked out his ground. As she turned into a darker road, the Ripper left his car and leapt on her, dragging her into this piece of waste ground. Despite a careful search of the whole area, there were no clues. It was the darkest moment of the whole investigation. Mr. Hobson was pressed hard as to whether the hunt could ever be successful. Oh, well, certainly it can be done. Uh, the morale of the force is very high, and despite what people say about public confidence, I'm sure that uh, we've got the confidence of the public behind us. Obviously, over the years, these officers have dealt with many, many murders, and they've had uh, a great deal of experience in the police service. And we're looking for new ideas at the moment. What he didn't know was that a breakthrough was imminent, thanks to two sharp-eyed policemen on vice duty. In Sheffield, they stopped a bearded man in a Rover car who had picked up Olivia Reavers. A routine check showed that the number plates did not belong on his rover, so they arrested him and followed their instructions to inform Ripper headquarters of all men arrested with prostitutes. At first, they could find nothing incriminating. Then one of them remembered a request from the suspect to relieve himself, and he went back to the bushes where the man had stood. There he found a hammer and a sharp knife, and later another knife in the police station lavatory. The suspect's name was Peter Sutcliffe. On the third day, he broke, saying, The Yorkshire Ripper. That's me. When the news was announced that a lorry driver had been arrested for one of the Yorkshire Ripper's crimes, the police held a celebratory press conference. They ignored the fact that their prisoner's Yorkshire accent made nonsense of the millions of man-hours they had spent trying to trace a killer with a Geordie voice. He is being questioned in relation to the Yorkshire Ripper murders. It is anticipated that he will appear before the court in Dewsbury tomorrow. I can tell you that we are absolutely delighted with developments at this stage. Absolutely delighted. The heroes of the hour were the two policemen who spotted the Ripper. They received a special commendation. Will you please convey to Sergeant Robert Ring and PC Robert John Hyde my sincere personal thanks for their outstanding policemanship on Friday evening, the 2nd of January 1981, they are a credit to the police service, and in West Yorkshire, we appreciate their efforts very much indeed. Well done. That's the end of the message. The Ripper's father spoke of his shock. I walked into the office, and there were some fellows discussing the fact that this chap had been caught. One of them mentioned that he had the same name as me. 
And then he said, have you got a, a brother called Peter? I said, no, I've got a son called Peter. He said, does he live at Eton? I said, yes. Thereupon, one of the chaps in the office pushed the morning paper across in front of me. And there it was. I know I'm speaking for all my family when I say that we all feel the same. It's a terrible, terrible thing and that it should be my son who has been the cause of it. Relatives of the victims demanded the reintroduction of the death penalty and the streets outside the police court were choked with vengeful Yorkshire folk. The Solicitor General was obliged to issue an urgent warning to the media reminding them that in Britain a man accused of a crime, however serious, is presumed innocent until proven guilty. But the pack was in full cry. One newspaper, the Daily Mail, had no fewer than 32 reporters and cameramen on the scene. As Peter Sutcliffe began to confess in detail, the police pieced together a picture of a man who had once been ridiculed and laughed at by a prostitute who short-changed him. In retaliation, he had declared a private war against all women that he judged, rightly or wrongly, were good-time girls, whether they were paid or not, were genuinely promiscuous or only so in his crazed mind. Most psychopaths, he seemed normal to outsiders, as his neighbours testified. It's just stunning anyway, I still can't believe it, to be honest. Because as I say, we used to just say hello to women. She were very quiet and she did the gardening, she were out gardening every day, she even did the painting of the house and everything, but just a normal couple. Well, when he first moved in about three years, three years ago, um, he parked his large lorry in front of our house, but in, uh, in a short time, he drove it away and we never saw it again, up to this day. The trial of Peter Sutcliffe began on May the 5th, 1981, at the Old Bailey. Sensationally, the judge, Mr Justice Borum, refused to accept the defence counsel's plea of guilty by way of insanity on behalf of the Ripper. Impressed by a new confession made by Sutcliffe, both defence and prosecution counsels had agreed that he could plead guilty on the grounds of paranoid schizophrenia. But the judge insisted that only a jury could decide whether Sutcliffe was sane or not. So the jury had to choose which of the self-confessed Yorkshire Ripper's two versions was true. Was it the one he had originally told the police, and which was now put forward again by the prosecution, that he was exacting revenge on all prostitutes after being publicly humiliated by one. If they believed that, he would in law be judged sane and liable to imprisonment for life. Or they could choose to believe the new story he had told psychiatrists and which was repeated by his defence counsel, that he heard the voice of God when he was a grave digger in Bingley Cemetery, instructing him to remove prostitutes to get rid of them. He worked there from the age of 17 and he told the court it was something wonderful. I believed then and now it was the voice of God. I was standing in an open grave taking a rest from digging. I heard a voice similar to a human voice but with the words mixed up. It seemed to be coming from a gravestone. I climbed out and walked towards the grave. I remember it to this very day. If they believed he really thought he could hear the voice of God, he would be considered insane and a candidate for Broadmoor. The Attorney General said he found it very suspicious that Sutcliffe had been in custody for more than two months before he mentioned the voices. As the story of the brutal killings emerged in court, the extent of Sutcliffe's luck in escaping detection became clear. Although he was one of the first men to be questioned over the tell-tale five-pound note, the managing director of his company told how he had been absolved of suspicion. Twelve officers came down and went through our firm, went through everybody, all the staff. And uh, they came back at, regu at regular intervals. But he was checked twice. He was checked for further questioning was Peter. When one of the girls in the office said she was worried about the Ripper, he gave her a lift. It was one of those dark, dreary nights and um, 
I just happened to say that I was a bit nervous and um, he just offered me a lift and I accepted. Time and time again he faced the police. Time and time again he got away. He was stopped in a roadblock after one of the murders. He was breathalyzed in a red light area. He revealed that one detective who questioned him was holding a photocopy of footprints made by the very boots he was wearing. A check on car numbers in another red light area turned up his car 40 times, but he said it was on his way to work. He was interviewed at home and gave an alibi which his wife unwittingly backed up. However, the detective was suspicious and recommended further investigation. This was never carried out. Trevor Birdsaw, a close friend, suspected him. He remembered Peter attacking a prostitute when they were out together years before. He told his then wife, Melissa, of a time in Halifax when Peter had gone off alone. Next day, he read of an attack on a woman there. He says, I think, I think it was Pete, you know, the Ripper. Because this was... Because of that incident, he thought it was funny then, and then it was after then, there was a murder on telly, after that. Trevor Birdsall wrote anonymously to the police after the Jackie Hill killing when a car like his friend's was spotted in Alma Road. It was never followed up. When Peter Sutcliffe stayed unrecognized after the photo fit was published, he was confirmed in his belief that God was protecting him. The riddle that the jury had to answer was, was Peter Sutcliffe a sane man pretending to be mad or a madman who thought he was sane? In the course of a day's deliberation, they found him sane and guilty of 13 charges of murder by a majority of 10 votes to 2. The judge sentenced him to life imprisonment with a recommendation that he should serve at least 30 years.